There we are. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. We're glad you're here tonight. We want to invite you tonight to just worship with us. Some of these songs you're going to know and you're going to be led to sing. And some songs you're just going to want to sit and read the lyrics. You'll notice that on all the songs the lyrics are provided up there. So we just encourage you to worship with us. Sing out loud. The Bible says to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And that's what tonight we're going to do. We're just going to worship the Lord. Amen. 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 Yeah. 
Amen. Amen. This next song, I want to encourage you and let you know that our God is a mighty God. He is always there. Amen. And I want you to know if you're in a struggle tonight, if you're going through a storm, I want you to know that God is always there for you. He never leaves and nor forsakes you. He is your helper. He is strong. I love, I love saying that the, our God is mighty. When he does an awesome work, he's just flexing his muscles and showing how awesome he is. Amen. Would you worship with us tonight singing always, always. My foes are many, they rise against me, but I will hold my ground. I will not fear the war, I will not fear the storm, my help is on the way, my help is on the way. Oh, I lift my eyes up, my 
Good night. <laughs> what a tr- let's one more big round of applause for the message of that and the work that went into that. And we'll have more to say, choir uh, and and Trey and Deb and all the people that have worked so diligently to make this happen. We'll have a little bit more to say in a few moments. You know, Trey and I talked about the fact that we just wanted this season to be so simple and hopefully so Christ-honoring. And um, I've prayed, my prayer all this day has been, Lord, please help us not to get in the way of this beautiful gospel of yours. And we're so glad you've all come tonight. We're so glad uh, for our guests and family members and our church family. And if you have your Bible tonight, I want you to turn to Matthew 27. If you don't, um, we'll try to get these verses up on the screen. This week, Christians all over the globe are remembering the events of the last week of Jesus' earthly life. Sunday morning, we talked about Christ, the Savior, riding into the city of Jerusalem. That night we talked about him eating that Paschal meal with his closest disciples and followers and breaking that bread and drinking that wine and speaking about his impending offering for our sins. And today has traditionally been known as Good Friday the date which many Christians ascribe to the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But friends, I want you to know tonight that if you were one of Jesus' followers 2,000 years ago, this day seemed anything but good. Would you look with me in Matthew chapter 27? And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, verse 33, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave Christ vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him. And they parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them. And upon my vesture, my clothing, my robes, did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and they set up over his head this accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. And saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, we'll believe him. He trusted in God. Let God deliver him now if he, will say, if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. You know, today when we speak about the cross, when we sing about the cross, we use flowery words of grace and power and victory. We use that symbol on the front of our Bibles. We hang it around our neck. We put it ornately backlit in metal or wood or some precious material and hang it in our churches. The cross to us is a beautiful thing today. Friend, I want you to know if you lived 2,000 years ago, the thought of putting a cross on your Bible or around your neck would have been as strange and as offensive as it would be for us today to hang the image of an electric chair around your neck. A syringe on the front of your Bible that would be used for lethal injection. Listen, crucifixion 
had not been invented by the Romans, but it had been perfected by the Romans as the most excruciating execution that they could possibly bring about. The word, the word crucifixion, the word excruciating literally means out of the cross. The great Roman statesman Cicero once said, let this crucifixion never come near the mind of a Roman citizen, never near his eyes, never near his ears. I read a comment recently which stopped me absolutely in my tracks that there had never been an execution devised by man that so completely destroyed a person. Not only ravaging their body, but destroying their mind, destroying their hope. The Romans had designed it that way. They tell us that when a person was crucified, they of course would have a nail driven through a part of their hand where they wouldn't bleed out that could sustain their weight, another nail driven through this hand. They would set them upright on that cross and drive a nail through both feet into that wooden beam. But they tell us it wasn't actually blood loss, it wasn't actually exposure that would claim the life of the person hanging on that cross. Most often it was asphyxiation. As they grew weary, as their muscles began to knot and cramp and their body was pulled down by gravity, they could draw in a full breath but they couldn't fully exhale And the further the day would go on, the further the time wound on, the more it was like having two thumbs pressed against your neck, choking the very life out of you. That's why when they wanted the person to die, they'd break their legs so they could no longer sustain any of their weight and they would literally suffocate. Listen, that person up on the cross was put up there naked as the day they were born, humiliated before all. They were nailed to that tree, exposed to all the taunts and all the elements and all the insects, writhing just to draw the very simplest thing of life, just a breath. History tells us that victims of crucifixion, in some cases, could last as long as nine days. Friend, it was a horrible thing that Jesus endured that day at Golgotha. Beyond our comprehension to see the sinless, innocent, pure Son of God hanging on that tree. But may I say I believe the great horror of Calvary, the great agony of the cross, was not even this physical torment nor the barbs that were being slung against him by scribe and Pharisee and Roman that no doubt did damage to his pure heart. The greatest pain of it all, I'm almost afraid to speak of. It's so mysterious. It's so captivating. It takes place in verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. At 12 o'clock noon, there was a supernatural darkness that settled in upon that entire place. And it lasted till 3 p.m. Some have tried to explain it by saying that it must have been an eclipse, but Passover was always held on a full moon. No, friend, God was doing something. And I believe the very devils who roamed this earth had all crowded into that place. The wickedness there was thick throughout the air. From noon till three, I believe there was the most eerie, horrendous silence 
broken only by the cries and the screams and the curses of two of the men hanging on those crosses. And then, my friend, the most appalling sound that had ever pierced this earth's atmosphere. Verse 46, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus was quoting David from Psalm 22. A few verses into that text, David would say, dogs have surrounded me. Lions have come against me. They've pierced my hands and my feet I'm like a worm of a man, not even a man anymore. But friend, I believe if you want to get down to what was really going on in that darkness, what was really going on on that cross, when Jesus, listen, the Son of God, don't forget, He didn't start out as a baby in a manger. He started out third member of the Trinity who had always been. He'd always had angels rush to do his bidding. He'd always been in the closest partnership with his Father and the Holy Spirit. That Jesus came down and was born to a virgin mother in a human body, and he lived those 33 years. But never forget where he came from. Listen, all throughout these Gospels we read that Jesus was misunderstood, that Jesus was accused, that Jesus was talked about and lied about. And so many times, even his own disciples didn't understand what he was up to, didn't understand what he was getting at. But every time Jesus had the Father, he would get away from the multitudes. He'd get away even from his own disciples and go and spend an evening, sometimes all night, just talking to his father. I remember one place in John where it says, everyone went to their houses, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. There had never been a moment that Jesus hadn't had his father in the closest intimacy you can possibly imagine. And now he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did he say it? I don't know that we'll ever be able to plumb the depths of it till heaven. But can I show you what I believe the Bible says was going on? In Isaiah 53, 700 years before Christ was ever born the prophet said these words surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken we saw him smitten of God and afflicted now listen but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Two more verses, verse 10. I can't even comprehend this. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him, the Father put the Son to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail, the work, the labor of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. My friend, listen to me tonight. Don't make the mistake of making Jesus a really good man or a martyr or one who is just proving the love of God at this moment of horrendous agony. The Bible says so much more is going on, though you don't want to discount those things. Christ hanging on the cross in that darkness. The Bible says he became our sin. 
Jesus, the sinless one, Jesus, the one perfectly pure, the first one since Adam, who never thought a wrong thought, never committed a wrong action, had wrapped himself around the glory of God with every morsel of food, with every action of his life. He had given glory to his Father. This same Jesus took the sins of the world in his own body on the tree. It's almost like nature was ashamed to even look at this. And hanging on that cross, Jesus, the Son, was treated like the greatest sinner who had ever lived. Oh, friends, you know, I think we are very, very prone to magnify the perfect love and grace of God, and well we should. God is perfectly loving and lovely. He is ultimately gracious and merciful. But just as true, He is absolutely and thoroughly and perfectly a God of justice. We frown on a human judge that will let some child molest or some murder or some abuser go free. Friend, listen, our God, the righteous judge, looked down on a human race that he loved, but that had rebelled against him with all of our heart and soul. Oh, listen, don't believe the picture painted on TV sometime that we are actually got a little bit of goodness and we're running after God. The Bible says there's no goodness in man, and we are running from God for all we're worth. We are as rebellious at our soul as Lucifer himself. And God in his justice had to punish sin. But God in his love wanted to be gracious to sinners. So he hung his son on the tree. And his son became your sin so that the father would punish the son in your place. The full wrath of God, every drop of it, poured out on Jesus Christ while he hung on that cross. A friend, a few moments later, And I'm so glad to tell you that's not where it all ended. Apparently that darkness was lifted and Jesus cried out, Te telestai, it is finished. Father, into into your hands I commend my spirit. Oh, friend, listen to me. That may not mean a whole lot to us today, but te telestai meant a whole lot to them in that day. If you had been sentenced for a crime, they would hang your sentence. They would hang your accusation outside the the, the, uh, door of your cell. They'd pin it to the wall. But if te telestai was written at the bottom... It is paid. It is finished. The guard would come by and open the prison gate and set you free. If you owed a bill, no matter how great it was in that day, if the word tetelestai was written on that, it meant it is completely and fully paid. And listen, Jesus hanging on the cross says, it is finished. I have paid it all. And friend, listen to me, he's not on that cross today. He's not in that tomb today. I'm getting ahead of myself because it doesn't come till Sunday. But Jesus rose from the dead. He's on the right hand of the Father. And listen, he's forgiven every sin. If our hearts could grip this tonight, if we Christians here tonight could just remember When this accuser comes to us and reminds us how vile we are, how disgusting we are, how many times we fail and how horribly we fail, if we could only remember Jesus died for every sin you've ever or will ever commit. It is paid till the last drop The Father burnt out all his wrath on Jesus, so there's no wrath left for you. And when Jesus rose from the dead, guess what else he did, y'all? 
He put the very righteousness of the Son of God on you. When God looks at you, we were talking about in our gospel class the other night, if this is the salvation you, and this is the completely sanctified, heavenly, never going to sin again, never going to foul up again you, and all in between is this rocky path of back and forth through which we all struggle. Listen, Jesus doesn't relate to you like the one that just got saved. The Father treats you like the one who's already arrived. He has forgiven our sins completely because Jesus paid it all. Would you stand with me tonight? I'm going to ask you for just a moment, if you would, to bow your head. Choir, musicians, Trey and Deb, all of you who had a part in this, I don't think you could have sung the gospel any more purely. I, I don't think we could have made it any simpler in singing about the blood and the glory and the beauty of Jesus. And tonight we would be awfully remiss if we didn't say, if you're in this audience this evening, Maybe you came with a friend tonight. Maybe you came with a family member tonight. And you just came expecting a program and something more has happened. Because you know you're a sinner. You know you've messed it up. And maybe for a long time now you've hoped when you stand before God one day and he weighs you in the balances that the good things you've done would outweigh the bad. Oh, friend, can I tell you on authority this book, they won't. You can't undo those wrongs. You can't make up for them. But Jesus paid it all. He'll be your Savior. He'll give you His righteousness because yours didn't cut it. He'll bring you back to God tonight. If this is your first time with us, if you've been in church all of your days, And people all over this auditorium and in this balcony would say, that's a Christian. But you know in your heart it's not true. Let's not wait till Sunday. Tonight, tell him you're a sinner. Tell him you've tried to be your own little God. Tell him it's been a miserable failure. Ask Jesus to save you heart and soul. Ask him to be your king. Ask him to be your God. And friend, tonight I believe you can be born again. I believe he's already after you or you wouldn't have come. Christians all over this place, will we waste a chance like this to praise our beautiful Savior? Will we miss an opportunity like this to bow at an altar or to get down right there in a soft cushioned seat or to bow our head at least and say, oh Jesus, how could you be this good? How could you love me this much? If you need somebody to pray with tonight, I'm here, Ron's here, counselors are here. If you need to talk to somebody about salvation, that would be make this the most beautiful day but all over this place let's do business with this living God and let's give him the glory he so rightfully deserves Father thank you God thank you just seems so inept insufficient to speak of what our king did on that tree can't fathom it Lord it crushes us but it blesses our soul thank you Lord Jesus for the blood thank you that we can sing these songs tonight and triumph Lord for that one that doesn't know you oh God pursue them so relentlessly change their mind change their will change their heart tonight we pray God, let some Christian who has wandered away and is so ashamed of themselves and they've forgotten the gospel that you paid it all already. 
bless tonight, remind us tonight. We thank you for it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.